All right, this is going to be my first little vlog uh, for church, my church story. This is my church story, or at least one of them. All right, it seems that no matter what church I go to, there is always an epidemic of dispassion or apathy plaguing a large segment of the congregation, most often the youth. Sure, the preachers and youth ministers are all often on fire, but be they the sincere ones or the insincere ones, Sometimes even the choirs are on fire, especially in the Baptist or Big Tell Evangelist churches, where everyone is expected to emotionally while out or speak in tongues and have a complete physical meltdown every service to show how touched by the Lord and the message they are, even if sometimes it's all for show. In every single church, whenever I tried to make a home there, they would aggressively welcome me, or my money, depending on the church, with open arms, get excited at seeing all the talent, skills, and passion that I had to offer their church, and verbally encourage me to share my gifts for the betterment of the Lord's house. Then I would begin to impassion everyone, excite the youth, and light a fire under all the other leaders, like a cheerleader supporting her football team, with a fun combination of my singing talent, songwriting skills, playwriting abilities, youth program leadership, and other creative ideas and altruistic strengths. Of course, in the beginning, when I got the green light and required resources from the powers that be to let the light shine and help the congregation, mainly the youth, spiritually grow and connect, I would flood these churches with my light so bright and get everyone fired up and ready to go. Even the most apathetic youth would suddenly shed the ice coats they were wearing, feel personally empowered or outwardly excited, and start letting their own light shine more and more. So then, of course, as with every church I've been ever been in, darkness would somehow rear its ugly head, kill the party, and suck the joy out of everyone's heart, the smile off everyone's face, and the laughter out of everyone's spirit. Some people called it politics, or legalism, or just the way it is. I called it greed, fear, and the devil. A wolf in sheep's clothing, the author of confusion. And the progress of spiritual growth and fellowship connection, of course, especially in the youth, would come to a screeching halt and everyone would go back to their apathy and complacency and part-time job mentality which I wrote about in one of my poems that uh, won some talent competition awards awards years ago about how everyone's so spiritually demonstrative and soulfully connected with their hallelujahs and praise God's inside of church at church and on church property but then everyone seems completely disinterested in spiritual actuality and soulful connection outside of church as soon as the stage lights go off and the public isn't there to watch them. At every church, I would message members that I was working with or working for about initiating a new project with them that was either music-related, youth-related, travel-related, show-related, or otherwise church-related. And inside of church, I'd get a very positive, spirited response. And But an outside of church, however, I'd get no response at all. But then if I talk to any of these same people about anything of no relevance whatsoever, just random whateverness, non-church related, they'd be like, oh, hey, what's up? Yeah, that's cool. And so on. You know, of course, um, then if I tried again to communicate with them about church projects, events, programs, ideas, performances, periodicals, or other activities and plans, I would literally hear crickets. Nobody but me actually seemed to care about church growth, innovation, or connection outside of church. I felt like I was the only one who cared about the youth, about the community, about society, and our true purpose in life, both together and as individuals here on planet Earth. Like everyone else was either asleep at the wheel or just pretending to care when we were in church, in church, and in front of everyone, in public. But then there was no sincere interest or excitement out of church behind the scenes in private. So for years I grew to feel that church, no matter what denomination, was only made up of two basic types of people. One, the spectators, who were the entertained people, who were very obvious and apparent in their lack of real passionate devotion and sincere interest, who were truly apathetic and just going through the motions like brain-dead zombies, either just because they thought they had to or because they sincerely thought that this ritualistic behavior was synonymous with having or seeking a true spiritual connection with the divine. And then there was the other set of people. Group number two, the performers, who were the entertaining people, who were completely full of crap, just putting on a show for everyone, full of all the Jesus lip service and public display that you can imagine. But then in terms of putting all that lip service and public display to constructive work and productive use outside of church, they were all conveniently unavailable. 
which is why I put into part of one of my poems how loving God, connecting for Christ, being passionate, getting fired up, and letting your God light shine is not a part-time job. It's a year-round engagement with no vacation days unless you just happen to get sick. Truthfully, it's always been weird to me, someone who loves connecting with others for personal, I mean, for positive spiritual community and unity purposes for years, trying to connect with someone of the most verbally expressive, some of the most verbally expre expressive and demonstrative church people in the world, who were like, praise Jesus, it's all about God and unity, let's make church better, amen. Then all of them becoming just as silent or dispassionate as the other set of church people and youth, who were obviously apathetic and disinterested once they were out of church. Once their feet left church property, it just felt so disingenuous and insincere to me, just so fake and phony, and a disappointing letdown, to be honest, especially when preachers acted this way, and you'd be surprised how many preachers appear to be this way. Oh, and then of course, there were some of those same hilarious performer church people who would dismiss, criticize, or judge you as if you were a bad or a weak Christian just because you were not as outwardly conformist or verbally expressive and visually demonstrative in your spiritual or religious public display and lip service as they were. Even though in truth you probably lived a cleaner life than they were, or had a more honest past than they did, or operated with a purer, more spiritual, more sincere heart and mentality than they had. Which is just so messed up in my opinion. Seriously. I've been judged by pretentious church folk and phony church leaders just for not raising my hands, shaking my head and murmuring praise God or running around and speaking in tongues during church service, music or prayer. Meanwhile, for example, I was, and still am, waiting for marriage and never even once engaged in any form of adultery while they were cheating on their wives or sleeping around with people in the church. Mm-hmm. I was personally mentoring members of the youth and trying to institute new ideas to help nurture and engage the youth more effectively while they were lying to the youth and promising them xboxes music demos and sports gyms that never they never delivered on i was giving my last hard-earned cent in the offering plate or to help out someone who needed the money more than me while they were stealing money from the church or riding to church on a stretch limo every weekend like a rock star when the only rock star in church should be jesus and they should humble themselves in his house, especially being leaders for others who will follow their lead. And they weren't helping anyone but themselves, unless it was a public display for all to see. I mean, don't get me wrong, I definitely have my vices, i.e. food, Facebook, and fighting verbally and pridefully and philosophical, philosophical arguments, failing to bite my tongue or be tactful, being self-righteous, blunt, and tactlessly direct, always expressing my opinions no matter how unwise or inappropriate the circumstances are, even to an ego-fragile boss or an impatient teacher. Yeah, my mouth has always gotten me in trouble that way because I would never know when to just shut up and ride the wave. So the point I'm making here in this chapter of the story is not at all about perfection, but rather about simple sincerity and basic honesty, about truth, and what really matters to God, which is the inner heart of the man, not the public display that he puts on for his gullible audience to see. I was being sincere and honest in my spiritual lifestyle than most, if not all, of my own church leaders were being, even though they were the ones who were super expressive and demonstrative in their very religious public displays at church. Yet according to some of these same people, somehow I was still the one in the wrong, who was somehow a bad Christian or some kind of intentional church rebel, just because I wasn't putting on a big grand religious public display in front of everybody like they were. Some of them even suggested to me that I should act that way anyway, even if I didn't mean it, just to be a part of the church leader frat, as they made it feel, because the youth and other people were watching me and following my lead because they admired me, and if I didn't put on a display, that didn't make them look good, and that didn't make them like me. Which I would later find out was all that really mattered to them, if they liked me and if I liked them, not if we were united as one in Christ. Apparently, based on the way they behaved, they actually felt threatened by my lack of conformity matched with the admiration of my peers or youth because it gave me too much power and without my submission to their superficial fashion of phony public displays and shallow rules of artificial engagement that made me dangerous to them or so they thought i always felt harmless like i wouldn't hurt a fly and at that time in my life i totally wouldn't and though i would eventually go to feel otherwise going back to my lack of emotional public displays in church to give you the backstory I was raised in a very uh, non-demonstrative, non-ethnic, conservative church and some very non-demonstrative, non-ethnic, conservative and wickedly rigid and just wicked Christian private schools my whole young life. So I wasn't accustomed to grand public displays of weepy emotion in church, nor did I feel very comfortable with it. In fact, in the beginning, when I first started attending churches that were more expressive like that, 
it kind of weirded me out a little bit. I was a little weirded out by it. And immediately I drew my suspicions, you know. It made me suspicious. I know I, I wear my heart on my sleeve, but I grew up behaving very sober, non-radical, and emotionally self-controlled in church. Also, I don't like to be expressive unless it's sincere. I don't do fake public displays. Um, I do it hits me naturally and um, as it happens. And if I'm hearing a lot of bullcrap or poison in the message that's being delivered to me, you know, um, if I feel like what you're feeding me is wrong, I'm not going to eat it. You know, I'm not, if, I, if I'm not feeling anything new or if I'm not feeling anything new or personally hard hitting in what you're saying, I'm also not going to uh, pretend I have and respond in an over the top way just to coddle your ego and make you feel like you did a good job in service today. I don't, I don't act like, I don't operate like that. That would break one of the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not lie. I mean, if I was your wife, I would act like that because, you know, minister's wife, you know, but I mean, if... If y'all know you like that, you know, you're not my daddy and I, you're not my husband, I'm not going to pretend. <laughs> Especially if I feel like the messenger is lying, I won't applaud that, you know, regardless of our rela or our connection with each other. That is what's dangerous in all of our churches today, is the, the lying. God means a lot to me, and I've always felt that it's more important to live him out than to just act him out. But a lot of church people thought differently with me. From my long list of experiences with various churches... The straw that broke the camel's back for me, however, was one church in particular which I call the Insane Asylum. I will not name it to avoid drama, but let's just say there were so many things wrong with this church. And it has a very popular church, or it was a very popular church last time I was there, but I just couldn't stomach the place anymore. Examples. The main preacher would cuss in church and say it's in the Bible, make dirty jokes and say, I'm just leveling with you, try to guilt his broke con congregation into giving offering in the offering plate twice during the same service, every service, while he showed up to church every week in a limousine, hawking his latest CD, promoting merchandise for us all to buy in the church store that was built into the sanctuary. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but wasn't that the one thing that totally pissed Jesus off so much so that it sent him into a violent, green, incredible Hulk-like rage in which he threw all the tables of merchandise up and destroyed everything in the Bible? I'm just saying. Does anybody else remember that or am I just the only one? And this preacher, he was uh, never available to talk to personally about anything. He just whipped in and out of church like a rock star, promised us a youth gym to keep kids off the streets, part of his pitch for us to put more money in the offering plate, and also promised people work or money gifts that none of us ever saw come to fruition. Oh yeah, and it was rumored that the reason his wife left him was because he cheated on her and may have been on drugs. I know the last part was hearsay, but it's hard to ignore it when you had up everything else. Then the youth minister, whoo! The youth minister would do some of the same things, like say wildly inappropriate things in his church sermon, promise the youth things like Xboxes, talent show prizes, and so on, and never delivered on them. And to top it all off, he hit on me when I was trying to work with him to help the youth with some of my ideas. And then when he realized that I was actually only spending church time with him to actually help the youth, and to get my creative ideas off the ground to seriously help the community and come to full fruition, in other words, when he figured out that I had absolutely no interest, intention, or even awareness of helping him cheat on his wife, no matter how cute and charismatic all the women said he was, suddenly he was no longer interested in working with me to help the youth. Just suddenly. He had no time. Suddenly he was unavailable. And then his wife and her friends threw me dirty looks, treated me like a horrible person, and not only dismantled all the work I'd already started doing for the youth, but um, also didn't give me the talent prize that I had won that they had promised me. So, yeah, everything was just destroyed abruptly, callously, and wrongfully, like a sandcastle washed away at sea. I felt completely ambushed by it, attacked like the rug had been suddenly pulled out from beneath me, just totally caught off guard, and naively unprepared for it all, because my thinking was wholesome, innocent, pure, Christian, and sincere, and theirs was not. But I was also passionate, intelligent, strong, dedicated, appealing, and eccentric, too. So I guess partly because of all that, and partly because of their own jaded mentalities and dark experiences, they all just ignorantly assumed that I knew what was going on with the minister when I didn't. I never know what's going on until after it's started happening or it's over. That's just, I, I'm, that's just me. It's been my whole life that way. That's the story of my life. They, did, they, they probably assumed that I was interested in him, or adultery, or church fornication, or willing when I was never, ever, when I wasn't. And um, that I had been somehow plotting or calculated or sinister or menacing or wicked when I hadn't been. Just it wasn't even my nature. But it was there, theirs. That's the way they were. But 
When people are prejudging and judging and labeling and stereotyping and demonizing and just blindly, you know, you know, assuming things about you and condemning you and their small, ignorant, fear-filled minds without ever even bothering to try to get to really know you first, there's not much you can do but keep your distance from them and pray to God that they grow in IQ. So that's what I did. I left the church and prayed for everyone in power there to grow in IQ and some legitimate character. Eventually, the youth minister and his wife divorced and left the church, but I never went back except occasionally a few weekends out of every year. The church was so big with such a heavy turnover, no one seemed to be from the crowd I'd left, uh, you know, the bad people anyway, you know, not that I could remember too many faces anyway. However, the main preacher was the same, so I still wasn't getting spiritually fed, and I felt both tired, insulted, unappreciated, irritated, and traumatized by the leadership staff there from my previous experience in trying to help the youth and make a difference in the community. So I was still driving on an empty fuel tank in a beat-up car from giving all of what I had and being compensated for it by being verbally and insanely run off the road by the leadership caravan that I thought I was helping and being a part of. I was in no emotional or spiritual condition to go back on the road, so to speak, in the church realm. I was just caught between the phony church crazies trying to freakishly control their gullible church followers with dishonesty, theft, and perversion, and the vulnerable church zombies, apathetic, bored, lost, and searching, looking for something that these phony church crazies could and would never give them, but still holding on, either buying into their un-Jesus-like charades or hoping to finally feel something this time, that connection, that fire, that love. I did church hop for a while with my family, but I never seriously tried to make a church home anywhere. I felt too burned and burnt out by it, and every church we hopped to seemed the same anyway. New churches, new faces, same story. It became very depressing, and I became so jaded by it that I just stopped going to church altogether for a long time, and just started getting into other forms of community service, like charity and politics. I had just had enough, was fed up with church, and didn't feel like I had enough help to back me up when I was there, and I didn't have, have any help to, make me, um, to help me make real change in society for good there. I felt like I was the only person in church with a genuine real spirit of light in God who was both awake and sincere, not just one or the other, but both, and who actually enjoyed doing and being a positive change maker for good, an inspirer, a humanitarian at heart. Not for the attention or for Rolex watches or tax-free wealth, but just for the sake of doing God's will, helping people and making this world a better place. I couldn't believe I'd been all up and down through all these different types of churches and still felt like I was the only one there who really enjoyed doing this just for the sake of doing this. To me, it was a calling. To everyone else, it just seemed like a profession, a day job, something you leave at a certain hour of the day and come back to the next morning, like clocking in and clocking out in an office. I wanted to let my light shine so badly, but it just kept being diminished. I got tired of it and gave up. I took a long vacation from church, became... Uh, because I became so deeply angry and distrustful of its leaders, of the greed, of the fear, of the self-centered dishonesty. And I got into social charity with my own charity organization called Party for a Cause now. And social activism with presidential political campaigning. Yes, we can, baby. And I just gave up on church completely. See, I'm the type of person that when I give something my all and then I get shoved off the road into a train wreck or car crash, it just kind of takes me forever to get back on the road. My emotions are powerful that way. They have a hold over me. And if I feel burned and bound out by something, I boycott it until I feel ready to get back on the horse and dominate the road again. Sometimes I just need that extra gentle or simple push from somebody else to get me back on the horse and back on the road again. And that's exactly what happened with church. One random day, my old childhood friend from Christian private school called me up and pleasantly asked me to simply help her complete her church's budding new choir and offer some of my ideas to help the youth there to get the youth back and keep them back after some church elders had scared them off. It had been so long <clears throat> since I'd seriously given church a chance, and so long since I'd begun feeling the need to go back, that I figured it was time to make like Sister Act 2 and get back in the habit. No, uh, it wasn't my church denomination that I was raised in, as mine was uh, went from Lutheran to United Church of Christ to non-denominational, if you love Jesus, holla! Um, but while hers was, as and likely will always be, Seventh-day Adventist, but in my opinion, God is God no matter what. And the point is, praise Him, reflect Him, thank Him, live Him, share Him, regardless of the varying fine print between the lines. Because in the end, that's what the point is. Not the politics or legalism or dogma or fundamentalism or what have you, but the fact that God heals, Jesus saves, the Lord renews, and we all need that each day. Our Creator gave us all a giant light inside us, and it's our responsibility to plug ourselves into Him and let our light shine its brightest, both in and out of church, both in public and in private. 
And when the world knocks us down, which it will, every day, that should only make us stronger by making us strengthen and further develop and nurture our faith in our Maker in that positive, beautiful way, instead of making us weaker and letting it kill our hope and faith in humanity and unity as believers, who are one in purpose. Because together, genuinely and sincerely and passionate with that fire, that light, that joy and excitement for life, connection, and God's love, we rise. And that's the only way to fully let our light shine. So I say, let's get fired up and ready to go, be impassioned, and rise up together with the flames of the spirit of enthusiasm, of joy, everywhere and anywhere, all the time and anytime, together and apart. Let's break the vicious cycle of darkness by reigniting the power of our hope, coming together and letting our light shine. This light, little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. It's time we let our light shine. Thank you. God bless. Thank <laughs> you.